CTIF, CTIF Super Mobility and Wireless Repair Expo. My name is David Sharma and I'm the Chief Visionary Officer at Revamp Wholesale. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and my fan base right here at the front, see you guys now. Um, quick show of hands, how many people are coming to CTI or the Expo for the first time? Wow. That's awesome. I'm glad you, glad you guys can make it. Um, show of hands, how many people have been here since 2014 or even before when it was just CTI and not even the Expo? Good, so we have some veterans. Good, good mix. I think it's absolutely wonderful that all of you made the time, the effort, and the cost to be here amongst peers in the industry and provide uh, value and gain insight on how to grow and develop your businesses. I want to first, by, first start by saying that I'm truly humbled and honored to be up here as one of the opening speakers for the show and also representing the Expo as one of the premier partners. I want to personally thank Michelle James, right over there, <laughs> for the years and years of commitment hard work and unrelenting perseverance to put all together this wireless repair expo for us and bring this whole community together. Uh, can we get a round of applause for Michelle? She's really still on fire if you guys can't tell me she is non-stop working. <laughs> um, I'm sure most of you probably know her and her background, but if you don't, I really urge you to spend a couple minutes with her sometime this week. Um, get to know her, hear all the fabulous ideas that she has and what she has in store for us as an industry and for the future. Uh, it's kind of funny to think that this started about three years ago with the Wireless Repair Expo because it feels just so much longer. This is one of those things that's kind of unique and cool and also sometimes kind of frustrating about our industry. It moves at exponential speed of technology, so what we're doing right now is not necessarily what we're going to be doing in the future. You guys have seen the <laughs> Apple uh, keynote announcement this morning. I thought this one was pretty good. Phones especially started acting up around Apple's releasing of the new one. So I don't know if anyone has older iPhones in here that started acting up, but you did, yeah? My battery already started to drain, so that's what's going on. I know that. You know what happened? We'll get a fixed real quick. Um, this graph here is a good representation showing kind of the advancement of technology over the last 600 years or so. Um, but what you really see, it was an exponential rise that came after the microprocessor in the 50s. Um, where we really started to take off this technology we own, which, like computers and cell phones and things like that. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures to kind of put things in perspective about technology. Uh, this was taken 60 years ago. This is an IBM hard drive that was being transported. Um, they weren't even available for personal use back then. It was just for companies and they had to lease them. And back then it was $3,200 a month, which nowadays would be $38,000 per month they were renting it. And the space that they could offer, Five megabytes. That whole thing right there was five megabytes of storage. So not even one song that you could store. Now in the palm of our hands, we hold hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes. And now we see why our industry is absolutely so you know, crucial and vital. So we know that technological advancements are speeding up through social media and the transfer of data, information, and ideas all across the world. Here over the next three days, all of us here have the same ability to make our advances in our businesses and grow ourselves, our employees, and our clients by transferring these ideas and information amongst one another. Let me give you a quick overview of Revamp Wholesale and how it started. Um, the majority of the people in the industry, whether you talk to repair shops or suppliers or anything like that, everyone has a really cool story about where they came from, um, and Revamp is no different. So Revamp was founded back in 2007 by my best friend, Anand Panda, the CEO. Um, picture there on the left. <laughs> Uh, Not that nice friendship goes back more than 25 years. Um, I think when we were about eight years old or so, we were by and stuff like that. And that's what Anant was like. That's the idea. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna start a computer repair van. I'm gonna go to people's houses so they can make it convenient for them, and I'll get their stuff taken care of. So I think probably Anant and some of the guys from iCrack were probably having some of the same visions back then. Um, so that's kind of where the idea started. Um, so in 2007, the business started as Revamp Electronics. Um, Anun started that business in his college apartment in Iowa during the days of iPods, Xboxes, and Microsoft Zune MP3 players, if anyone still remembers what those are. Um, the business was mostly distribution for the first three years until 2010 when Anun moved the business to Chicago, and then I came and joined shortly after. 
After seeing success from companies like You Break, I Fix, and reading about Justin Weatherill and other people making huge dents in the repair community, we decided that we would go full into the repair sector. At our peak, um, when we started in 2010 with iRevamp Electronics, we were doing about three to 4,000 iPad repairs per month and pretty much any other phone we could get our parts hand on and figure out how to repair. Um, in my heyday, kind of just to brag a little bit, I could strip an iPad 234 in like less than three or four minutes and then I could put it back together in about three or four minutes. So about a 10 minute repair all said and done, which was pretty impressive. So in 2013, we'd had this repair shops for three years and we had a couple pathways that we could go. We were contemplating, do we continue to grow the repair business and start to look at franchises or opening up more of our own locations across the state? Or do we want to do something different? We realized that to open up multiple repair shops require a lot of capital investment that we just didn't want to get into yet. We were also running into a lot of quality issues that were causing us major headaches in the repair shop. Quality issues with specifically the parts that we were getting. We knew that we wanted to scale our business in this industry, but we also wanted to make a positive impact. We saw an opportunity to do this on the supply side of things. Making the transition into supply side was quite interesting, actually. For years, we had been all over Google AdWords and online competing against all the other repair depots out there. Now that we had to go and actually talk to them and convince them to buy our parts, it was pretty humorous. So has anyone here seen the movie Tommy Boy? Chris Farley, David Spade? Okay. So picture that, <laughs> that was an and I, the first road trip, we just hit the ground running, we decided we're gonna do some Tommy Boy style sales. Um, <laughs> the first place we went to, I won't share the name of the company, uh, but we had a great conversation with them. We told them what our mission was, why we got out of the repair sector, and you know, why they should be purchasing parts from us. At the end of the meeting, they came back out, they handed Anantha a check, and they handed me a piece of paper. When I opened it up, I found this in it. They told us that for the last one year, my picture was hanged up on their wall by their repair techs as a target practice for them because they were specifically aiming for us. And one of the main reasons was because we were on Google AdWords and they had seen us and they had known about us. Um, so I didn't know at that time whether to feel humbled by this or feel a little terrified. <laughs> um, but being that that was our first sales call into the transition within our industry, it was a big eye opener to me about what competition really means. Every day I know that as a business, you're keeping an eye out for your competitors. As a repair shop, you want to know what the guy down the street is doing, how much he's charging for his iPhone repair. As a supplier, you want to see who's offering the best shipping deals, giving the best RMA credits, or producing the best quality. And that's fine. It is good to see what others are doing in the industry and sometimes take notes or adapt. But the truth is that these competitors have nothing on your proprietary secret, which is you. Anyone can look up a tutorial on how to repair a device, and anyone can get on Alibaba and source parts, but that doesn't mean you're going to be successful. It really is your dedication and your commitment to your company, your brand, your employees, and your customers that will ultimately depend on your fate. I am personally very proud to be part of such an amazing team with gifts and assets that complement each other very well. Starting at the top with Anantu I mentioned before, our CEO, you would be hard pressed to find someone in the industry that has as much in knowledge of about the parts and supply chain. His better half and partner in crime, Ashley Honda, sitting next to him is our sales director and has actually been responsible for getting us on the Inc. 500 list twice, two years in a row. Uh, this year we actually ranked 45th fastest growing company in the US. This is only possible with the work from everyone that we have at our company, whether it's the warehouse associates, customer service, sales reps, brand managers, even Mia, our mascot, <laughs> sales reps and coders. Overall, all said and done, we have a team of about 35 plus in about 10 countries and we are growing. So what is it that Revamp is doing differently? Well, one thing is we are listening to our, com our customers and then we're adapting. One thing we believe at Revamp very much is continually evaluating blue ocean strategies or strategies that can create additional streams of revenue. It is something we truly believe is crucial for any business looking for lasting growth. When we started distributing, we had repair parts. We wanted to put a brand on them to recognize quality we were committing them to. That was the birth of our new premium quality parts. The next year, after receiving feedback from our customers that they need to add up, or they wanted to provide more upsell products, we launched SimpleSnap. SimpleSnap is the, what we consider the world's easiest screen protector to install. So not only do you provide an upsell for your customer, but you also create an experience 
between the store and the customer that creates a long-lasting bond that allows the customer to return. So after Simple Snap started to gain traction, again, we received feedback that we needed more than just screen protectors. So over the last year, we have created the Mongo brand, which is a line of premium phone and tablet accessories. These accessories include cases, power cables, cleaners, charging blocks, headphones, four-in-one sticks, etc. Coming up, we are thinking ahead of the customer requests and starting to look at the next wave of repairable items. Wearables, drones, VR, robotics, 3D printing, all those to add to our SKU list. There are already repair shops across the country that are already taking advantage and actually diving into these repairs head on. These repairs which will become household items very soon. There are now many great software developments out there in the marketplace that are making it easier for companies to operate their business and be successful. Revamp is proud to be integrated with RepairDesk, which is a cloud POS software for mobile uh, phone repair shops. Usman Butt, the CEO, will actually be presenting some of those integrations tomorrow morning at 11 a.m., the same time in this room, so you guys can check that out. So in addition to increasing our SKU count, bringing on board the parts and tools that repair shops needs, what do you think is the number one request from repair shops? Anyone? Don't say lower pricing, because we hear that all the time. It's, <laughs> it's quality. Undoubtedly, it's quality. What we're talking about here is creating a quality experience for the customer, and that means using a quality parts so that the customer can leave happy and stay happy until they break their device again and then come back to see you. So how, does, how as an industry, do we work together to increase this quality? It can't just happen with us as one supplier or with one repair depot. Instead, we have to look at it collectively as an industry. So what are the standards and what are the grades? It's kind of tiring when you look through all the different websites and you see grade A+, grade B, grade C, S+, premium, aftermarket, and actually know what it is that you're getting. All of us as suppliers use different methods of classifying our parts, whether they're actually apples to apples comparison or apples to oranges. So we recognize as an industry that we still have a lot of work to do regarding raising the bar for quality parts. However, over the past year since the last CTIA, we have made great strides into putting our own competing agendas aside to come together with better coordination as an industry. Revamp, along with other suppliers, have opened up the behind the scenes door to our actual quality control processes so that we can create a standard that best serves the industry. In addition, over the past year as a company, we have started to use third-party testing companies to derive what those different standards are amongst the various manufacturers of LCD screens. The most important thing for us is not to be a supplier who sells the most, but the supplier who sells the best product and has the happiest customers. Just by making these changes over the last year, we have already seen it translate to the manufacturing process in China, where we're seeing continual improvement in the quality of aftermarket parts. So ultimately, we all need a channel that we can trust. Repair shops, you need a channel that you can trust for your suppliers. And as consumers, who we're all here to serve, we, they need a retailer and a technician that they can trust. So we can only do this together. I don't know if you guys have seen High School Musical. We're all in this together, OK? Until the end. I'm kind of ashamed that I know that, by the way. But. <laughs> all right, so what, what can we do here? What can we do now? Oops. So how can you increase value at the show? Sorry, technical difficulties. So what can you do here? Huh. That's fine. How can you guys increase value at the show? Well, first things first, I want you guys to talk to everyone you meet. Even if you're not on the show floor, chances are when you're walking around in Vegas, someone is probably part of this wireless repair community or is connected to someone who is. So share your knowledge and teach someone something new and try to learn at least one new thing every day that you're here. Another favor, talk to at least one of your competitors, if not more. And don't try to do it stealthy where you flip your badge around and try to act like you're not who you say you are. Do it openly, show your logo proud and talk with them openly about what changes and improvements we can collectively make. Talk about your customer experience and what each of you can do to provide that repair shop experience. The last thing is try to find at least one new revenue stream that you're currently not using, either in your repair shop or in your supply chain. 
So maybe it's adding a new line of accessories to your part so that you can have more upsell, uh, providing warranties for your customers, offering pre-owned phones, and possibly other consumer electronic devices to your shop wall. Whatever it is, let's make the most of it here in Vegas. I personally am looking forward to meeting every single one of you and seeing in what way we can grow our businesses together. And I hope you guys are going to do the same with one another. So thank you for being here and looking forward to a great week. Like 3,000 iPads, yeah. It was a 40,000 phones or something. There was some big number, and then you, you said you transitioned into being a part supplier. Why did you, what went into making that decision? Why did you get out of the repair business? I think one thing we saw when we were scaling the repair business is when we were trying to add on. So like I was saying, I could strip an iPad in three to four minutes and no one could assemble it. So we were thinking, all right, worst case, if someone can do it in half as good a time. Well, what we came to find out is people were doing it four to five times longer, overhead was growing up. So just to increase that, to find those technicians, which really wasn't available in the marketplace that well, that was kind of where we decided, do we want to invest in growing these franchise shops, taking on more money, growing in with a lot more employees, or do we want to serve the industry on the parts side and still remain growing, but not require those trained technicians and things like that? That was kind of the decision. But we knew that if we wanted to get in the parts side, it really wasn't wise to stay in the repair sector and keep competing with everyone else. Yeah. And now, I have a pretty loud voice. Um, now, here's the uh, current forecast of the parish, uh, or the, the parts industry. I know that was one of my thoughts, uh, refurbishing parts and things like that. Um, a year ago, iPhone parts were, or even six months ago, was going crazy. They were 90 bucks, 80 bucks for iPhone 6, and now they're $25, $30 high cost things like that. Um, did that, uh, how, how, how do you feel about your decision now, you know, a year ago, <laughs> decision now? You mean how crazy and volatile the market is? Exactly, the repair industry is kind of, you know, you can always kind of jump into where, like you said, a, a virtual reality, drone, yeah, things like that. Exactly, exactly. Actually, you know, still getting stuck and investing all this time, effort, um, and everything in the parts, uh, and then having to go to one third of its value over a year, you know, you know that's, that's been real tough, at least for me. It has been tough, and I think, I think everyone's felt it, but I think the one thing we do is you have to stay on top of China and the market every single day. You can't miss a day. And that's one of the advantages we have. And Dunk, our CEO, is also our purchaser. I don't, think a day, I don't think a day in three years has gone by where he hasn't spoken to a manufacturer or supplier, and he's in the know with everything. What's happening with the market? What are the trends? How could they shift one week from now, two weeks from now? So that, as a supplier, through you know integrations with repair desk and things like that, we want to educate everyone so that you guys are stocking up in the correct order that you need to be and not running into these issues with price volatility. So that is something I think that is relied on the supplier side because we have that direct information. We're talking to the manufacturers first. So I think it's up to us to help educate you guys on, hey, when the markets are shifting like that, what can we do? How can we forewarn you? Does that kind of answer your question? Yes. Um, you mentioned that quality is one of your main concerns. So what is the difference between me buying from you or direct from China or whoever? So a lot Where of things differentiate. How do you differentiate? So Their price point, quality. Okay. So in the let's say at China itself, there's probably different vendors or different suppliers and manufacturers that are there. So one thing that I was talking about that we've done over the last year with a couple other suppliers is kind of been like, okay, what are the quality checks you guys are putting your suppliers through? Here's the quality checks we're putting our suppliers through. Then we went to a third party company and we tested those and we got the results so we could send it back to them and be like, if you guys aren't hitting these specs, you're not, you're not cutting at that point. So I think how you can differentiate us between other suppliers, other suppliers are probably not doing that because we weren't even doing that two years ago. So I think that's one thing for us to actually actually have standardizations and facts and numbers that we can provide repair shop owners to say, hey, your screen should test at this million lumens because that's what Apple says it should. And that way it's, I think that provides a little bit more transparency rather than saying, hey guys, I have, I have the best, I have OEM, I have A++, just buy it. If I can tell you, hey, this is why, here are the categories that it went through, here are the tests that it went through, here you can actually replicate this test, here's the machine that was used. I think that's why you can probably trust someone who's being a little bit more open to people. Okay, and how do you stand by that? Like, what do you give more warranty? Like, generally speaking, that I buy, I get between a month and three months warranty. So, where would you be? 
where would we be in terms of the warranty and things like that? I mean, right now we have lifetime warranty on our new parts. We have six month warranty on everything else. I think as we feel more confident with some of these changes, it would only increase the warranty times. We don't want to. We don't want to hurt repair shops. We know that one month, two month RMA is not. That's not easy for you guys. And um, thank you very much. That was yeah. great here. And price wise, like if you're going through all those extra processes, this must become a clean. It, it will add a cost, but it's more so educating those manufacturers so that they can get the process down and then they can improve the quality and then the price will just normalize again. I think there is there is a little bit of upfront cost for these suppliers, but the nice thing is China's willing to work with us. They want to, they want our feedback, they want to know what customers think of the screens, and they're happy with everything we send back. They make the improvements, and we don't see too much of a cost difference even on our end, because they know this is something they're just gonna have to start doing. Okay. If they want to keep up in the industry. Was the gentleman behind me mentioned that he's buying screens for twenty three dollars? Mm -hmm. So would you sell the same screen or a better screen for that at the same price, or would you be like five dollars more? Or oh, you mean if I have the exact same screen as someone no, else? No, but your screen went through this ridiculous testing process. It's not. I mean, it's not huge. Don't think of it like it's something where we're spending you know, tens of thousands of dollars extra. It's just it's these tests that they can do at the manufacturing things so that they know what they're producing batch wise is going to be good. And I think even if you were comparing apples to apples, I don't think it would be more than a few percent difference. I don't think, I don't think as a retail shop, you would notice that. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, we're getting, uh, we're getting hammered price-wise in our, in our industry. We're uh, not the leader in terms of price. We're falling what we're trying to strive for. Mm -hmm. And um, consumers seem to really focus on the price and try to change the conversation. It's not easy. So price is something we have to continue to work on as well. Um, you know, some of our costs are moving towards a lower cost uh, product to buy. So for you guys, for instance, you guys have your copies or your yeah. actual market as well. Um, in the industry as a whole, or at least in terms of your inventory, how reliable do you feel like the lower cost options are um, in compared to the higher priced versions of the same or similar products? Um, can you maybe elaborate a little bit more on that in the tiers that you guys have? And yeah, I mean, the tiers that we're kind of focusing on is that Renew brand, which I told you guys, which is our premium products um, that we're standing with a lifetime warranty that's OEM grade. And then we have what's considered a hybrid, which is refurbished with possibly OEM LCD grade components and then other components and assembled together. And then there's premium aftermarket, which is obviously 100% all aftermarket. So in that process, we have to look at the components, the individual components and their reliability, and then also the assembly process. So things that I was talking about earlier with like the lumens or the contrast ratio that your screen would have. That's what we're going to the suppliers that are selling those aftermarket we're saying, hey, here's our threshold. If you're producing screens that are less than this, we're not going to buy them. And those screens do exist on the market. And if you put them side by side, you can tell night and day. So in terms of educating the customer on what you can do, it's things like that. And that's what we're trying to do as an industry. All the suppliers together, people in the industry, we want to create a, like a voice or a message that you can actually go and tell the consumers, hey, this is why you want to use this product. Here's the actual difference. So for your, thank you for that, for, for your at the market then, you're going to say that uh, as, as, as a repair shop or as a consumer, if you were to buy an aftermarket version or your new brand and put them side by side, would you say that there was a little difference or would you say they've gone through enough testing and even your aftermarket is going to be the same specs that you can't really see the difference? I'm, I'm going to honestly say that it will be different at first. At first, yeah, until the technology improves, the aftermarket won't compete on the exact same level. I'm not saying that certain consumers won't be able to tell the difference or see it with their naked eye, but as an industry, as we know what we're doing, we know the quality in terms of where you're sourcing those components from, and then also the assembly process and the QC. So aftermarket, we, we stand behind. It was funny because when we first started uh, the supply side, we actually didn't want to carry anything that was low grade. We were like, let's just carry the best of the best and only the best. Then repair shops started saying, man, these guys just don't care. They don't care if it's this OEM grade screen. They want to $50 cheaper. So we said, okay, that's fine. We'll get it. And I think that's what the whole industry did as a collective. Now we're saying, okay, those aftermarkets, they still need to hit a threshold. We're not saying they have to be exactly like OEM, but they have to pass a certain level so that we can tell those shops, hey, these did pass. You can tell your consumer that this is why you're paying less for it. And here's what you could get if you spend a little bit more. Gotcha. So you're saying most repair shops are going to get system for repair? I don't think they are, actually. I think most repair shops are just picking. I know some in the past have, and they'll say, hey, we can use an OEM grade screen, and it's $20, 30 more. If you want, you just want to get it fixed quick. I can use the aftermarket part. But I think a lot of people are kind of picking what is their brand, and we see a lot of consistency with that with our customers. So if someone's buying new, they're pretty much only buying new. If they're buying aftermarket, they keep buying aftermarket, they're fine. Okay. 
Final question. Yeah. Uh, the middle tier that you talked about. The hybrid? The hybrid. Uh, if you put that beside the renewed screen, since the LCD would be OEM, would you really see a noticeable difference between those two screens side by side? <coughs> Not as much. No, because it would be an OEM LCD. There may be other factors where the assembly process, so obviously everyone knows about frame issues coming off and things like that. What glue was it hot melt glue? Was it cold press glue? Those are maybe more of a noticeable difference rather than maybe the LCD or the appended test by the make that. Gotcha. But you're reducing at the lowest RV rate to the best quality screen, fewest issues, and that's why and that's why it's standard that lifetime warranty too. Thank you. Yeah. So you use the mic please. Oh sure. Recording. So then, because we're not using um, the OEM parts directly, do the phones, like the more complicated phones that are out now with um, like the 3D touch, can you meet and match that quality of the OEM? Yes, yes. Technology-wise, that's the kind of Okay, and then do you get the phone recalibrated? Because I'm thinking of if I got my screen replaced and then a couple months later my phone seems to be degrading, what do you do? Say that again. Let's say if I go to a place and I get my screen replaced, because I actually have one right now, yeah. and um, thinking about doing a test to see if my phone functionality starts degrading, and then I come back to you, what happens at that point? You mean what happens at the repair shop level? Right. I would say as a repair shop, I'm just like, they're going to want to take care of the customer with that fact that there is something wrong with the screen, and then they're going to want to deal with it from the supplier side. But I would hope as a repair shop, you're always trying to do what you can to make sure you're taking care of your customers. And even if it's an issue on the supply side, don't pass that along to your customer, bring it back to you know, us, your suppliers. Got it. Okay. Yep. How do you plan on handling the uh, compatibility issue of Apple's new release on their software with replacement screens? The uh, which model? Uh, on the iPhone 5, 5C, 5S, and iPhone 6. Uh, on their new release of their software, there's going to be a compatibility issue with replacement screens, and the screens actually have to be from Apple because there there will be a software on the actual screen Is itself. The new iOS that's still in beta right now? Uh, well, there's the 9.3.4, yeah. and that the compatibility issue, and the screen isn't as accurate. And then with the iOS 10, they're actually going to require that the screen be Apple original. Hmm. Yeah. That is yeah, it's, it's kind of like, well, it's kind of like how like the iPhone 5S, if you replace the actual home button, the uh, touch ID yeah, like will not work. Exactly. It, it will be. I don't know if the IC chip on the screen will be very similar. I think they're actually saying it's just going to be an issue with the 10-mile screen. The 10-mile screen? Yeah, so the actual LCD itself. It's the actual like, uh, touch screen. It's kind of like in like an iPhone SE, if you put in a replacement screen, uh, the LCD is like fuzzy and stuff, right? Um, there are now, there are now chips that do work with those. So I think maybe that was an issue and then it's one of those where they caught in. Right? I think that's just like the last time this happened, right? Which is on the uh, three tiers that you mentioned, can you kind of quantify that into what your defect rate is on, on each of those three? Between the renew and the... I mean, what does that quantify to? I think the, we're under 3% RMA rate on all of them. I would say we're used probably close to like a 1.5% rate, where the aftermarket would be close to a 2.5 or 3 rate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What do you guys think as repair shops in front of your, are you guys seeing high defect rates with certain screens or anything like that? Depends on the batch. Depends on the batch. On the batch. Yeah. yeah. You can have a batch where they have one out of 100. And they have another batch where you have like 10 apples. Yeah, absolutely. Like okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Question me. So, where are you guys based out of? Chicago. Okay, and what does your shipping look like to California? And do you have a minimum order quantity? Uh, I think our minimum order quantity is down to $100 now. Uh, and then you're 
get free ground shipping on the 250, free overnight on 800, free priority overnight on the And that is one thing we are trying to continually work on, obviously, is the logistics of how they get the parts to your shop faster. Because we know a lot of repair shops are JIT, they're just in time ordering, so they get the parts. Next day, I understand that certain things like overnight in one screen has a huge, you know what I mean, has a huge market for that cost. So we're working personally with FedEx, we're working with other, other ways that we can get the screen to you guys faster and lower costs. So if, um, as compared to ordering from China, you know, big order might take a week, you know, maybe a little bit less. Um, how would you compare your pricing? Are you more like three, four dollars more, or more like ten dollars more compared to China suppliers? I would say, I would say I, there's not like a set. I think it also depends on the screen. Um, you know, certain things like out to seven, we see a lot of frustration in prices and things like that are happening again. Um, obviously, when you're talking about competing direct with China, or just how we are competing direct, obviously there is that thing where there is a little bit more lead times. You know, having the RMAs, you know, deal with a little bit longer, not having someone in the U.S. be your line to speak under, you know, things like that, just business hours and stuff. So that's how we're competing more or less with China. But we're not denying that people can go direct to China. That's how we started going with them too. But I think it's one of those things where people start to learn about some of these headaches, and then they start to come back to some of the domestic suppliers. At least when we talk to other suppliers in the industry, that's kind of what we see. Some customers, you know, they gravitate towards China, and then two months later, they kind of come back after their first issue. So, um, based on your RMAs, you know, as comparing to China, I know it is kind of a headache and there's shipping costs. Do you guys pay shipping costs to do RMAs, or is that covered by, like, the we shop? Do, we do not pay shipping costs on RMAs. We do okay. We, will, we offer the points and everything to replace the part, but in terms of getting it back to us. And do you replace the exact same parts, same colors, or do you just well, kind of give some flexibility? We give you the credit for that part. So let's say it was an iPhone 6 screen and you are made it one player, and let's say you don't need an iPhone 6 screen, we'll still give you the money if you wanted to buy one from the device. The money on the current market price? The money on the current, the idea is we would want to replace it at that value. So if you need another iPhone 6 screen, even if it dropped 20 bucks over the last two months, it still would cost you $20 less, so that's the value, which we'll give you. Okay. But it's good you brought up on feedback about our and things like that. It's something we are looking into to help customers out. We have uh, been ordering from China, and, and largely the LCDs are great. Um, and so we're, we've gone the cheap route. We have a 20% uh, warranty rate, and it's almost all from separation from the bezel frame. Okay. Have you guys addressed that with your low-end product? Just the boot. Have you addressed that issue? Have you seen that issue from other repair shops? Oh, sure, yeah. The frame separation yep. issue? Yeah, absolutely. So how are you addressing that with your product? I mean, the best way is with full press boot, the CPG technology, which is a little bit slower process, but it binds it a little bit better. Sure, yeah. no, understood. But you, so you're doing cold press glue on your $20, $25 screens, the, the low end six. Okay. Can you share the question? Uh, we do certain approved clients at this time. Europe? Yeah, as long as they're approved. Just, uh, just need some basic background information, things like that. There's a lot of scams in our industry. What's the, what's the criteria? Uh, it's really just a credit check. Yeah, yeah, just a battle of business and things like that. Registered business and some documents you faxed over to us. And then that You're out of your upper area? Or? So, you started off as a shop, you transitioned to a wholesaler, and you started working with suppliers in uh, China. Mm -hmm. It's a big jump to go from Chicago to China. Can you speak to how you made that jump more specifically? I mean, I'm like, it's in my shop doing repairs. Oh, yeah. let me go talk to somebody in China. Is that a lot of <laughs> I'll tell you, Skype. Okay. Skype, I would say, is probably our number one tool. Like I was saying, I know Skype's from the time he wakes up till the time he goes to bed. Always talking to someone in China. Sleep? Huh? <laughs> Pretty much. You would know, right? <laughs> I'm sleeping. But no, that's, that's how you have to do it. That's what I was one thing speaking about the industry is you can absolutely go to China, you can deal with that market, but it's not a market you can play with once or twice a week. You need to be in it every single day, or I guarantee you will not survive. Is that something that you guys sent somebody over there initially to make some actual physical contact with? We did strategic partnerships at first um, with people that own the factories over there, and then just kind of grew from there. Okay. 
but it's the daily communication, it's the upkeep and understanding the market. It's also talking to people that we're not necessarily working with just so we can get a lay of the land of what's going on. Whether we're buying Tianma or not, we want to know what's going on with them so when customers come to talk to us about that, we are properly educated. Do you still own the repair shops? No, we, we shut it down in 2013. The idea was we don't want to compete at all with anyone. Well, except the other supplier. Because that pisses me off with some of my suppliers. That they do do repairs? Yeah, yeah. They, and they say trade only. And then I see these people walking in that are definitely not trade. Yeah. And they sell to them as well. That's, and that was our, that was our manager. He was like, maybe we'll keep going in about that. And it was for just reasons like that. Like, we wouldn't want to deal with the supplier who's also just repair sometimes. <laughs> Um, how big are you guys, like in terms of, I hear about the employees, but what's maybe your monthly volume of screens, your purchasing power? I mean, just how would you guys compare yourselves to other uh, suppliers in the industry? Top three, I would say, purchasing power. Top three or top five for domestic purchasing. I mean, we can purchase three, four million a month if they, if they have a good stock for us and we need it. Is that kind of what you're looking for, but that yeah. purchasing power? Okay. Yeah. So um, this question might be a little off, but uh, we're not in the repair business. So how, what do you think the longevity of this industry is? Are, are screens going to, you know, I can't imagine they can't come up with a screen that doesn't break or a phone that doesn't break. Um, they might not do that so you could keep buying iPhones and whatnot. But, um, you know, where, where to... Kind of along with it, along yeah, the last. yeah. I mean, the way we look at a lot of times is, let's say, now the iPhone 7 came out, if we know there's parts, then we know the industry succeeded for another two or three years more or less, and we can still, people are still repairing iPhone 4s, right? So you know that that's it. Right? At some time, if there is a shift in the paradigm of technology, how there once was more computer repair, now there's more cell phone repair, that's also what we're trying to be forward thinking on, you know, do these shops maybe thinking about VR? Do they need to be thinking about drones? Do they need to have robotics, 3D printers, things like that? Because um, at some point, you're going to want to do some repair. I don't care if it's iPhone, computer, what it is. I know that these repair shops, their long activity is to keep repairing devices for consumers. So on our end, we want to keep supplying the parts for those devices. But in terms of this right now, I would say, now for this new iPhone release, I think we're good for another three years. Before <laughs> anything else crazy changes. And in terms of the whole, will someone create a screen that won't crack? You just have to think about it if you were the manufacturer. Would you ultimately want a product that wouldn't break? No, probably not. The same reason why Apple likes to update all their software and they can get a new or a new device. So I wouldn't get for it too much. So, so last summer we had a price spike in the middle of summer. And very recently, you know, I've get emails from Chinese suppliers every night, dozens of them. But there's a lot, a little bit of chatter going on right now that the Chinese government is clamping down on the Apple logos, on suppliers leaking parts to the repair industry, and that sort of stuff. What have you heard in that area? All of that. <laughs> yes. uh, a lot of rumors, to be honest. A lot of stories of people getting raided, and people going to jail, and things like that. I mean, Ultimately, if we all want to be honest, we are all kind of a gray market industry um, when it comes to these things with copyright and how these products get released and things like that. Obviously, we want to do everything to make sure that we are completely legitimate, but those types of scares are, they're happening. And I think as an industry, we can do is grow our voice even bigger, so that hopefully companies like Samsung and Apple will start to take note that, okay, this is necessary. They're, you know, Repair, repair centers across the country just don't cut it, and they need these other places to do that with quality parts and quality technicians. So that's part of our fight, too, is to make sure Apple and Samsung knows that like, this is a real industry, and it's not, it's not slowing down anytime soon. You guys can crack your whips all you want, but ultimately, don't you want to help your consumer out? On that same thread, are there any trends that you're projecting? In terms of? Well, like what Bob mentioned a few years ago, there was a glass show. So are there any trends that you're projecting for your own business? In terms of China. China. In terms of China, China, I know that the glass was one, that indium tin oxide was a scare that was maybe gonna make LC touch panels hard to make. Um, it's one of those things if we've not hurried yet, the scare from the manufacturer, the people sourcing the raw materials, that it's just not there yet. I mean, I, I don't want to forecast that there is gonna be another shortage. I want to think that the people that are making the component level stuff are keeping up with the demand and recognizing trends and things like that. But it is one of those things where if those things come up, price shortages, someone gets raided, something happens, we have to be able to just adapt and work with that industry. Because it is, that's the industry we live in right now. Nothing's really set. Sure. 
For your LCDs, your high copy aftermarket, mm -hmm. do you use like one, two, three suppliers? Do you guys swap around? What do you do as far as um, your suppliers? Try to stay as possible, to be honest. Um, we always do like to shop again, like I was saying, we like to talk with every supplier out there, anyone that hits us up, we like to give them a shot and see what they're screaming about, but we like to keep everything down to about one or two main vendors that supply us everything. That way you also have a little bit more control. And almost, all those things I was saying about how we're trying to enhance quality and things like that, that's how we keep building these strategic relationships to keep working together with these same suppliers. Okay. And do you, as far as your LCD manufacturer, do you stick with like Long Tang, Tianma? What do you typically lean towards with those? Or do you carry several different Shen types? Zhao, I think is the name. Hmm? Shenzhou. Shenzhou. Okay. Um, and then, oh, I had one more question. I just forgot. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you foresee the uh, prices on the uh, success and success plus screens going down anytime soon? Yes. The aftermarket's yeah. Is it testing phase right now? Is that like a, uh, something that's a month out, six months out, a year months. out? Month to six weeks. A month, okay. You also sell the... Um... Thank you. Do you also sell the small components like screws, um, earpieces and such like that? And do you also sell screens with those things pre-assembled? We do. We do on both. So we do carry small parts. We do carry screens that have the small parts already built in. And we are trying to also increase the small parts to use that we have. Do you have those available in each of your three tiers? No. Not for, the, not for full assembly. No. Okay. But it's one of those things, again, with customer feedback and customers need certain things, they're always more than welcome just to reach out to us. We're always willing to change or adapt. Because maybe something you're thinking, 10 other customers are thinking the same thing. No one just spoke about it. Just, just real quick, since yeah. the Apple iPhone Seven just got released this morning or whatever. Yeah. How much are you already already right now supplying parts for the iPhone Seven? Or how is it released? I mean, it's, it's so close. When do you start to, to make that jump? Within two weeks after the phone's release. After. Yes. Like I really see that's the price. You mean when the parts came out and everything like that? I, I think I start to see it within, within two weeks. Just out of curiosity, before the repair business, and um, you know now, resale, uh, wholesale. What what were your guys' background? Like, what what did you guys do before that? Uh, mine personally, I was um, in school for entrepreneurship and business administration. Um, my transition in 2010, seven to ten, before I came to Revamp full time, um, I was at a wholesale distribution company for Granite and Marble. Um, just countertops and things like that, but it was a good way to, again, it was a distribution company, same thing, we had to deal with suppliers, quality, and things like that. Um, that was my background, and those backgrounds in computer science. Um, we've been a serial entrepreneur since he was about seven years old, building websites or fixing, fixing things, so definitely tech background, strong tech background. Do you remember that question you had? <laughs> so I liked your um, Target story. So do you have a picture of somebody or a company that, that do you have a company or a person that you guys as an organization have the Target on that you're, you're chasing after? No, we don't. We don't have that. Um, if anything, we, I don't know, I feel like we, we really respect our competitors and the things that they do well. And as a repair shop, we work with everyone now that we're competing against. I mean, we bought screens from them, bought parts from them. I mean, there's nothing really bad I have to say about the other supplier in the industry. Like I said, we're actually working hand in hand to try to make this industry better, make us all do a better job. So, now, no, there's no one on our target yet. Not yet. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, what other integrations are you planning on having with other Windows sales systems? Um, in the industry, yeah, I know you mentioned uh, was it Repair Desk? Repair Desk is our first integration, um, and then we're open, you know, to other software platforms that are out there. 
Um, I know repair shop is what we use, and um, is that well, I see some nods up front. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, it's in production to coding and everything right now. So, Keep gotcha. On, so, what would integration look like in terms of a uh, point of sale system? How would that order entry happen? Is it you know just in time? You know, inventory where automatically you guys fulfill orders without us even talking to you? Like, how does that? You mean how does repair shop or um, uh, with, with any point of sale integration, like, are you guys looking at doing it so that we literally don't have to ever contact you guys? You just send us parts when we need them, based upon our inventory. Like, is that something we can do? That was kind of what the MOQ and the reorder points and creating the automatic invoices for the next one. I think there's still a sense that we want someone from the store to have some oversight, whether it's a purchaser. I, I just, I truly don't think any machine automated system can truly take away that kind of human aspects of our industry that we're in. Um, but I, I know we want to make it as close as possible, where worst case, you at least would get a report at the end of the day saying, here's what you need to order. If you approve it, click it, and you're going to go ahead and us. Gotcha. Thank you. But you ideally would look for something where you don't have to think about it. your inventory is just getting replenished. And well, I mean, a daily approval is not a problem. I mean, before shipping times, a couple hours so that it could go out the same day. I mean, that that's great. Uh, the big issue is carrying so much inventory on hand. Placing big orders so you don't have to deal with it for a while and you know, it's just a hassle of continually, you know, counting or updating the inventory system and verifying things are good and then ordering and you know, not finding vendors that can do everything. You know, have a vendor for iPhone, I have a vendor for Samsung. I mean, you know, that's that's just kind of the big struggle is like looking to find one vendor that can supply us. That would just make my life so much easier. If we could trust, for instance, you guys to do everything. Easier, right? One stop shop, everything you can get, right? So a follow-up on that is, uh, how are you guys with your Samsung lines? I haven't heard much about it today. It's been a lot of talk about iPhone, but uh, what do you guys do in terms of sourcing Samsung screens? Authorized. Yeah, it's authorized Samsung parts now. <clears throat> so does that mean really expensive? <laughs> it's, it's, it sounds expensive. Uh, no, I would say it's right along the market price for it. Okay. Like, like, I mean, they are pricey. But do you mean in terms of if you were getting it from like an aftermarket source or something like that? Or? Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, as a repair shop, we're trying to do the S5 for around 199 for the repair. I think we're sourcing in somewhere between maybe 120 to 140, I think, somewhere in that general vicinity, usually. Um, do you have any idea of like where you guys are at for that just particular screen? 150? Approximately. Gotcha. But that's for the authorized. And you don't have any competing, because you're doing the authorized part, Samsung's not going to let you sell anything else? No. They've actually shut down most aftermarket facilities in China and things like that already, so I don't, I don't even know if you can come by aftermarket Samsung parts that easily right now. So gotcha. most people will have to go to that later on. And then again, it's trying to educate the consumer that this is what's going on in terms of the prices that have been dictated and things like that. It's tough, I know, with certain things, because the S5 is some really nice new considerations here. Yeah. I mean, you're saying one thing to take consideration is with Samsung Uprise, it's, it's no RNAs. You never have an issue or anything like that. Yeah. Speaking of POS integration, are you going to integrate to Repair Q? So. So we have Repair Desk, and we have Repair Shop coming up after that. Okay. And then so Repair Q, I mean, we're open, like I said, we're open to the conversation with any of these platforms. Just need to see the logistics of how we need to get it done. Okay. In an ideal situation, same answer as last year. So, um, how much of actual part assembly do y'all do here on state sides versus like LCD and glass and everything combined here versus do y'all buy already pre-assembled? All 100% purchased, already assembled. No, nothing is done in the United States here. Okay. Sure. Yeah, it's just kind of like you're saying, it's just kind of like the logistics uh, what's your opinion on the personal refurbishing systems that you can buy and use? You can just refurbish on your own? Yeah. Um, I have kind of mixed reviews about those because I've seen people who've been very successful at doing it, but I've seen more people who have not been successful in the long run of doing it. So my thing would be make sure you are working with someone who's had prior experience to it so that you have to set up everything right so that you're doing it good. In what sense, what are the long-term issues? 
I think people are having issues with quality, with having um, specs and dust and things like that, having the temperature with glue. All the whole process and everything like that, I feel like a lot of people in the US have said, okay, the technology and the equipment's there, they're doing it in China, why can't I just replicate it here? It's one of those things, unless you're you know, investing your company to do that full time, I don't think you should treat it as like a side thing where it's like, hey, we're also going to refurbish screens. I think it should be something that you're really focused on. And there are companies in the United States that are doing it, they're doing it very successfully. But from what I've seen from repair shops that have tried to do that on their own, they usually tell us three months down the road, it just wasn't worth it, or we had hired to hire this new QC engineer, it just became this hassle and everything. So. Part of the horrible failure of wasted love. Huh? More of the horrible failure of wasted love money. <laughs> more or less, more or less. But hey, we all learn, right? We learn and grow. We have time for one more question. Can you just elaborate more authorized? You said Samsung authorized. What is that? From, from direct from uh, Samsung distribution. So from an authorized distributor from that we get it from that. So RMA wise, not the changes. It's, it's, it's just still for us and everything like that if there was one. You, it's not like you can go back to Samsung or anything. But honestly, Samsung authorized one of those things. It really is almost the same. They just don't have it. Unless the technician has something. Thank you. We'll have time for questions outside, but we are going to prepare for our next meeting. Thanks, guys.